Well, the good thing about this is you get to edit it. You get to uh, do the intro again, you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I hope everybody's doing great tonight. I am. We're going to go back and uh, look at chapter 1, verse 21. Let's open up with that again. Okay. I'll be doing a lot of reading tonight. <laughs> All right. I might need some more light. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became fu futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. You want me to continue? Nope, that's good. Okay. Because there's something interesting here in this text, which we, I think we talked about last time. And he, he started off verse 21 because, which we're talking about God's invisible attributes are seen, clearly seen by the things that are made. And then he throws this because in there. Verse 21 says, but because, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts, and foolish hearts were darkened. And I find this really interesting because those that don't want to see lose the capacity to see. People that can see the full attributes of God in the creation don't want to see. They don't want to attribute anything to God. And their thinking became futile, vain, void of results. They became foolish. And I, I like that term darkness because it means to deprive of light, to make dark the mind. So people's minds became more darkened. So I'm hearing a little bit of hissing sound. Is there I don't know what that is. It's Maybe it's my air conditioner or my uh, fan. Is that better? That's it. Okay. I help okay, them. verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools. So, interesting here. I like this one. I like this one. So, professing to be wise, they became fools. So they claimed they had a free will, and they went deeper in the nonsense professing to be wise, leading them deeper into their darkness, into their error. So because they didn't want to bring in the light, they kept on going deeper and deeper in the darkness. And we see that today. We see people professing to be wise. I mean, we all know that we came from monkeys. We all know that we came from slime. That some light, lightning bolt hit some slime pits, and we became a living cell, right? Right. A little darkness there. So, now, let me say this. A fool is not an idiot. But a fool is one who has intellect and abuses it. So, a fool is not an idiot. A fool has intellect, but they abuse it. They became foolish. Hmm. And how they become foolish. Look at verse 23. And change the glory of an incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So instead of glorifying God, they became more foolish. And what did they do? They made God into images. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> so now... We get to worship birds. It seems why not worship the snake? Seems kind of silly. I mean, yeah. for someone that thinks of themselves as so wise, I don't know. <laughs> well, I use the word foolish because the Bible yeah, uses right. foolish. Okay. So what they're doing is they uh, exchange the glory of God. It says right there. The glory that belonged to God, they exchanged it. They 
They transform the image of God and the whole creation in a downward progression from men to reptiles. And so we know what happens when man worships idols. I think we talked about this last week, didn't we? First Corinthians 10, 20. Uh, yeah. Just a second. When you worship idols, you're worshiping demons, it says. First Corinthians 10, 20. Well, let me find it. Too far. What is it? 10, 20? Yep. Okay. Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. And that is a scary passage when it comes to our, our time in history. Because a whole lot of things we worship. I mean, our movie stars, our rock and roll guys, it is amazing. So as man rejects the light and the wisdom that comes with that light of God, they move into idolatry. Putting God completely out of the picture. Boom, he's gone. So idolatry is worshiping anything that's not God. So here we go into idolatry. I mean, teenagers, unless you're raised in the church, have huge uh, idols. And I've noticed something. That humanism in our day and age has replaced idolatry. So we now worship humanism, which is going to culminate in the worship of the Antichrist. As in the day of Caesar. You know, Caesar was God. We're going we're gonna to go all the way to worship into this humanism to when the Antichrist comes. We're going to be so in awe that we're going to worship him. It's going to be an amazing day when that happens. Yeah. Okay, verse 24. Uh, 24. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Okay, we got a little problem that must be faced. Now we're dealing with a reverence to sexual immorality. So, in the earlier verses, we had cultic prostitution. Now we're into immoral relations in the ordinary life. So, when you have cultic prostitution, is when you're worshiping idols, having sex with idols, or with temple prostitutes. Now we're going into the average person having sexual immorality. So, we find out <clears throat> that the fertility cults made use of the prostitutes based on definite rationale. And the religion back then was predicated upon the belief that no, uh, nature was controlled by the relations between gods and goddesses. So if they had sexual relationships with the temple prostitutes and worshiping them, they were hoping that their crops would grow. They'd have more kids, their cattle would be blessed, and so on. It was kind of a magical time in history when they had sexual intercourse in the shrines. Okay, and we talked about worshiping demons through the representation of idols or in the prostitute's tents. So it says here that God gave them up. In essence, he didn't abandon them. He allowed them to go their own way. He did not intervene right. because they rejected him. So it's just that they went from dark to darker to darkness. And the question is, where is the point of, of no return? Did it become so dark there's no return? Well, no, because anybody who believes that Jesus Christ can forgive of sin 
they could they could come back into the light, which Jesus Christ is the light. So there's a progression of darkness that takes place, but Christ can always reach into the dark of darknesses to redeem mankind. Now it says that they dishonored their bodies through sex or fornication. And when I was in college back in the 70s, I had a professor there, Dr. Eno, that used to say that when he taught, when he first started teaching 30 years prior, there were no terms or sexual terms were never in print. They didn't talk about the sexual terms we have today. So when he talked about sexual sins, fornication, adultery, uh, types of sexual acts that people do, like we talked about in the 70s all the way up to now, he said those things weren't even talked about. So there are certain terms back then. Now we have created new terms for sex. And it's interesting to watch our culture change. Okay, now verse 24, he also said, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. So now what we're looking at is that I, I like a term for lust. And I use I, I call lust this. We look, we linger, we long, and then we lust. Becomes sin. And I think that's a pretty good pro progression. We look, we linger, we long for it, we lust, and then we go into sin. And in any one of those time frames, from looking, linger, longing, and lust, we can stop. And again, we're talking about a lust in our bodies, in our hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. We're dealing with lust here. Okay? Verse 25. Oh, 25. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped the served sorry, worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who was blessed forever. Amen. Okay. Great verse. Who exchanged the truth of God for a lie? <clears throat> so we saw the progression here. Verse 18, they suppressed the truth. We saw that. And then they went to verse 23, they changed the glory of God. And now we're in verse 25, they changed or exchanged the truth. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. Well, now we are exchanging truth. We're taking the truth of God, giving it over and grabbing a different truth and taking that as our own. Interesting. And he and he ends that verse with, who is blessed forever. Amen. He is the creator of all things. Who is blessed forever. Amen. So be it. He's blessed forever. So be it. Amen. Interesting way to end a concept. Okay, now, look how the Apostle Paul changes the context. <laughs> Verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. So he creates a connection here. Now we go from idolatry to immorality. So they invented their own divinities, allowing unbridled passions to become extreme. But because of exchanging, they now go to an extreme passion one for another. We talked about humanism, how they worship the creation. So now he's talking about how women exchanged it for another woman. 
So sin comes from the mind and perverts, perverts sound judgment. So let's look at James 1, verse 13 through 15. James 1, 13 through 15. James 1, 13 through 15. Yep. Write them down. Okay. You bet. Um, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Okay. So now we see that God is not tempt, but it's by a person's own lust. <clears throat> so Sin comes from the mind or from its own lust. And I said, we look, we linger, we long, and we lust. And we go into sin. Now, even the women, which we think that women would hold the line. But even they went against God in their natural bend. And a lot of times we think of, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, the men, homosexuality. Right. But the scripture says even the women... Did not hold the line. But they went against the natural bend. Uh, and even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. So they burn. They, there's an unquenchable fire in them. No natural desire, but it's perverted and distorted. So the, the light became darker and darker. Okay, now, I have a note here. And I wrote this in because I thought it was interesting. It says, from the time of 1950 to now, the homosexual community is going full speed. In the 1990s, they proposed a full attack on the church until all negative passages are taken away from the Bible. They also proposed a full attack on the young to indoctrinate them to the lifestyle. So, from 1950 to now, we know what happened in the 90s. Homosexuality became a public paraded thing. And now in the church, even churches will not call homosexuality a sin. Yeah. So, we have got to come up with a Conclusion, is homosexuality a sin? Are we exchanging the truth for a lie? Abs absolutely. Throw that out. Is it true? Absolutely. The water? And in the church, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it says in verse 24, therefore God gave them up to uncleanliness or debased mind in the lust of their hearts. So God gave them up, verse 24. He gave them up to uncleanliness. He allowed them to go deeper and deeper into that darkness and that error by rejecting the truth. So God did not okay it, but because of free will, he allows it. Right. Hmm. Okay. Verse 27. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Two words, burn, unquenchable. That has no natural desire, but it's perverted and distorted, so they burn. They had an unnatural, distorted desire. 
and use the word penalty. Is it unquenchable? The lust goes deeper and deeper and is never fulfilled. So they have to figure out new ways to fulfill their perversion and their sexual perversion. And I mean, we can't even talk about what takes place in those realms. I mean, if I was to do a quick commentary on the sexual, homosexual lifestyle, uh, we would be shut down. Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm not going to go there. You know, we just, most people don't want to hear about that. Okay, verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do the th those things which are not fitting. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I mean, yeah, it doesn't fit, does it? <laughs> A little pun yeah. intended, huh? But it is interesting. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I've got a scratchy throat tonight. So we're we talking about it debased or reprobate. And this term many times is applied to metals or not standing the test. Metal that when it's made into like a sword, it's tested, it breaks, it scars. So God, because they refuse to acknowledge and to worship God, they no longer have the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not that the Holy Spirit stopped working on them. It said that because they became so debased, they no longer can feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So a lot of people think that God gives up on people who sin into what we call perverted sin. Well, it's not true. God is always there. I mean, I give you examples of many people who came out of homosexual, lesbian lifestyles, demon worship. Satanism, uh, people who, uh, you know, Will Chamberlain, he had over 10,000 sexual encounters. Is he a Christian now? Oh, okay. no, that I'm sorry. Uh, but have you ever heard of anybody saying I've had, you know, 10,000 sexual encounters? Yeah. I think that's what he said. That's what he's quoted to that's say. That's a lot yeah. of women. Yeah. So God gave them over to do these things because they suppressed the truth, was what we read earlier. They did not deem it fit to keep God in their knowledge. So when we do not keep God in our knowledge or, or deem it fitting, then we go to the test. That means our metal is tested and we fail. So to retain God is really the test. Let me say it again. To retain God is the test. Will we retain God? Or will we exchange him? Will we reject him? Or will we worship corruptible things? So to retain God is the real test. And I hear this quite often of even Christians who get so mad at God. They say, why do I want to worship or serve a God who's, who allows these things to happen? Oh, why yeah. do kids get cancer? The Old Testament stories of people being murdered, you know, whole cities and so forth. And you know, people never really studied enough to understand what happened back then. So to retain God is the test. Okay. Uh, Any questions? No, but that's one of them questions everybody always asks is why does God let us go through pain and suffering and two questions or two answers, I mean. One answer is we choose it in our own lust. 
we linger. Or two, we're like Job. Right. God allows things to happen to prove that we serve him. Job. Satan. You see anybody as righteous as Job? Ah, oh, man, he won't worship you if you afflict his, his lifestyle. If you afflict his family. No, he won't worship you if you afflict his skin. So God says, oh, yeah, he's a righteous man. Watch. Boom, boom, boom. Right. How righteous he is? Yeah. And then God restores tenfold, hundredfold, yeah. whatever God wants to restore. So really only two reasons why. And 90% uh, of it is our own lust. Okay. Verse 29 through 31. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of these, approve of those who practice them. So uh, I could just see the apostle's mind rolling Sounds like, like he's on a rant. He's, he's writing he? these things down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got a problem, man. He's just listing all these things that, because he, he's close to God. He knows what God likes and what God does not like. So I can see his mind just going off. Like, okay, these are some of the things, guys, that we have to watch out for. And I can imagine in his travels, because he was a missionary. So I can imagine in his travels and his missionary journeys going from city to city, he saw these things. And I can imagine he probably got beat up enough in the witness certain things that uh, probably poked him or stuck him. And he can see him clearly. And I, I can imagine when he got down to the point where he said, inventors of evil things. So, like today, there's no satisfying some of those evil desires. So they have to invent evil. Things to fulfill. Still, there's no fulfillment. And I look at our politics today. Uh, man, I, I tell you, man, I look at what is invented on TV. I think all the stories that are invented... In the politics, and I go, they're inventing new ways of evil to harm the other party. One party invents another evil saying or distorts a, a something to harm somebody else. So, <clears throat> I think it's interesting to look at Paul and figure out what he's saying here about us. I'm not going to go through each word, but each word <clears throat> has a great definition to it. And uh, I'm not going to take the time. I think they're self-explanatory to a point. Okay. Uh, we'll go through 31. Look at verse 32. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, who that the these who practice God, such things are deserving of death, not just, only do they, sorry, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Okay, I love the way the statement is ended because we already talked about the degrading process of 18 to 25 and so forth going on down. But he says here, knowing the righteous judgment of God, they recruit others to do the same thing. He says right here, they know the righteous judgment of God. They know what's going to happen. So the Apostle Paul was preaching the gospel and now he was ready to preach in Rome. So he's he's relaying to the people in Rome that when he comes to see them, he's going to reaffirm, hey, guys, this is what I told you about, about sin. Sin must first be preached. Redemption has got to be preached. People are guilty of the penalty of sin. 
there's a power to sin, but we all can be delivered from the presence of sin in the future. And I like what he says here, verse 32. Knowing these things, they are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So not only are they joining, but they are approving. Interesting. So not only has the darkness degraded, but now it's come to a point where they're promoting. It's almost like uh, recruiting, isn't it? It's like, ah, come on. It's recruiting, absolutely. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I hate to say this because I had a debate about 20 years ago. I went to a parade um, down in Los Angeles, and they had a group there called the uh, before eight or it's too late was their slogan. And it was a pedophilia group of homosexuals. And that was their motto. They had a big poster. Their motto back then was before eight or it's too late. So they had to recruit children before eight to get them into the lifestyle or it was too late. And I remember having an argument with one of the guys there and with a sign. And I brought up the term God and judgment or even harming little kids who have not had a chance yet to think through the process of their sexual identities. And he looked at me and he said, dude, there is no God. And he said, you're an idiot for believing that, that there is a God. And there's life after this. There is none. You're an idiot. You're a dumb, stupid guy. And I said, no, there is a God. And uh, you will see him for all of the children that you've harmed before they were eight years old. I said, there's a judgment coming on your head for what you've done to all these children before they were eight years old. And he just laughed, laughed at me, you know, and just kept on walking in the parade. And I discovered something at that time in my life. I discovered that these verses in chapter 1, about a hard heart going deeper and deeper into sin where God no longer convicts them because they push God out of the picture is true. And that was probably the first time I saw and had a personal encounter where somebody told me I was the stupidest man on the earth for believing in God. And the consequence was before eight or it's too late. And it was the hardest thing I could do. I have to understand, I was in my 20s. So it was the hardest thing I could do not to clobber the guy. I mean, it, it Yeah, I can bet. <laughs> I was a, yeah, I was a young man, and, and uh, the parade itself was pretty bad. Um, but that was the first time in my life where I, I got very angry when I saw that sign. I mean, I, I got very mad. Yeah, I got really mad at that, in fact. So, anyway. So, he ends it, chapter 1, or we ended that. Because it was man to put the chapters and verses together. Paul didn't end it. That's our chapters. Ben's way of looking these things up. Right? right? Okay. Right. Any questions so far? No, not really. I I love this this scripture because you see the progression. I mean, they did this, so this happened. They did this, so this happened. You can just see it descending as it's going through. Yeah. Yep. And then in verse 29 through 30, you get to see the acts of the progression. Paul tells him, this is, this is what happens to you. Sexual morality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, whisperer? whisperers, backbiters. Is it kind of like a gossiper or what? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to, par uh, to parents. Wow. 
Interesting. Undesert, undiscerning. Untrustworthy. Unloving, unforgiving, and unmerciful. I mean, when I see some of those acts, I just go, wow. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, it is. It's a good progression, man. It's good insight. We are in chapter two. Therefore, Verse one. you are inexcusable, O oh man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. Okay, Paul now is addressing the Jews about sin. So he just did a universal thing to Gentiles. Now we're going to find out that we're talking about some Jewish brothers here. We had the same disclosure in 120 to the Gentiles. So Paul's explained to the Jews self-condemnation. Okay, verses 2 and 3. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same thing, that you will escape the judgment of God? Interesting question mark. Judgment, he said here, is based on truth that has been revealed. And this truth is the complete truth. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth. And this truth has been revealed, and it's a complete, absolute truth. It's based on evidence. So this truth is not based on evidence that is incomplete, but complete. And Paul refers to the practice of the Gentiles who flesh it out. He just got them talking about it. The Gentiles flesh this out, burning one for another, allowing their fleshly cravings to win. He just got done addressing that. But Paul's going on to speak to the Jews, condemning them for doing the same thing. They also will be under God's judgment. Just because they had the Ten Commandments didn't mean they followed them. So when he used the word against those, he's talking about divine justice. Who judge those practicing new things, doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God. So against those is divine judgment. Now, I love this part. He explains this okay. in detail. Look at verse 4. Two, four. Or do you despise okay. the riches of his goodness? Forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads us or leads you to repentance. So we see God's tolerance, we see God's patience. And the idea here is self restraint. The idea that God has self restraint on judgment. So the Greek word here is used of a temporary truce between two armies, is what he's saying. God is holding back judgment to give the opportunity for repentance. It is divine long-suffering and forbearance that we'll have repentance. So God restrains or he suspends the execution of his wrath on which sin deserves because of who he is he is god he is good he is righteous so people who practice these things which we are talking about god has self-restraint hoping that they'll come to repentance i made the illustration that back when I was in my 20s, it was everything I, go, I could do to have restraint not to clobber a few guys holding those signs. And the only reason I did was I knew I'd go to jail. Because there are tons of police walking up and down the parade route. And I knew that as soon as I clobbered one of these guys, I was going to jail. And maybe a lawsuit. 
But God, in his character, is holding back for repentance. He's not human like I am. And Paul uses the term, do you despise the abundance of God's goodness bestowed upon the Jew? So look back in history and see how God blessed Israel, even when they rebelled. The story after story in the Old Testament of Israel, the Jews rebelling, repenting, and God restoring. So the good thing about repentance is we get to go back into the goodness of God's grace. When we repent, we get to partake of God's goodness again. In essence, we miss the lessons and the purpose of God's goodness. What is God's goodness? He allows repentance. God's goodness is we get to experience it again once we repent. And I've heard testimony after testimony of people who have repented of their sins that found God that have said, I cried when I fell to my knees and repented. I've heard story after story of people who have walked away from God, who came back, and now they're stronger than ever. They'll never walk away from God because they've tasted his goodness again. Yeah. You hear what I'm is saying? Is it like a, I don't know, something no stronger? I mean, does it, I know that's kind of a corny question, but when they come back, does it, is it like a stronger pool or something? <laughs> Well, yeah, I think it goes deeper. I think that the God's grace and his love covers over all that sin and buries it and stops that sin. Oh, you want to, is that for your husband? Drop right there and I'll, I'll put it in here just a minute. No, I'm going to put it in mom's office. Okay. 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 That was my daughter. Okay. <laughs> Brought in a gift for her husband. I was going to hide it in my office. <clears throat> For his birthday. His birthday is tomorrow. So I, I think that when we are forgiven of our sin, I think that goodness and that emotionalism of being forgiven and seeing the goodness of God is so magnificent that it just bubbles up. I, I just think it's fantastic. I think our emotions and the forgiveness and God's love in our hearts uh, just bubbles up. So let's uh, look at a couple of verses before we close. We have just enough time to look at a couple of verses. Uh, Acts 20. I'd like to look at Acts 20. 20. Verse 20. And I want us to read all the way through uh, 31. So we're talking about the Apostle okay, Paul 2020. here. Okay, How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you pub, uh, publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord's Je Lord Jesus Christ. And see now, I go bound in, in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. <clears throat> okay, hold well, on for a minute. So, we see Paul, which we just were talking about in Romans 1 and 2, that he's saying, I publicly taught these things, even from house to house, by the goodness of God. Okay, and now because of this, because of him teaching these things, the Holy Spirit has shown him that he's going to Jerusalem. He's going to go to to Rome. But none of these things okay. move go me, ahead. Verse 24. nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that 
you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Whoa, <clears throat> whoa, Paul taught over and over, house to house, city to city. And he said, I'm afraid that when I'm gone, these wolves are going to come in. They're going to tear up the church. They're going to come in with false doctrines. He says, therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So Paul gave his whole adult life to preach the truth, which we are reading in Romans. Chapters 1 through 8, Paul laid it out clearly. And he said, watch out because these evil men are going to come in and distort my teaching. The absolute that Jesus Christ gave me. Jesus Christ taught him, which we talked about in our opening right. chapter 1 the doctrines, and the truths that we're reading. And with tears, with tears, he said, watch out. Okay, one more verse. Ephesians 1, 17, verse through 23. Okay. Ephesians chapter 1, 17. Ephesians 1, 17 through 23. Okay. All right. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know that... No, what is the hope of his calling? What are the riches of his, of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Which he worked through what? 23. Uh, where was I? 23. Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, which fills all in all. All the alls in there. It's <laughs> yeah, well, what I love about this is that we just talked about the Apostle Paul doing all of his teaching. Now we see in his letter to the Ephesians, it says, your eyes <clears throat> have seen this truth. Your understanding has been enlightened. God has given you wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. 
you know what the hope of his calling is. <coughs> you know what his working mighty power is in you. And how he raised Christ from the dead. And all principalities. In essence, what he's saying here is that you are blessed because you know the truth. Because you know the truth, you understand the teachings, what Christ has done for you, especially as the Apostle Paul has laid them out, is that your, your eyes see and you are blessed because of it. We are blessed people because we believe the truth. We are blessed people because we have not exchanged the glory of God for reptiles. We have not exchanged the glory of God and worshipped humanism to where we find sexual fulfillment in the same sex. Right? I mean, we are blessed people by believing this truth of Jesus Christ dying, rising from the dead, shedding his blood to forgive us of sin. And then we will see him in glory. It's it, it's an emotional time. My mother passed away um, last Wednesday. So uh, I was there with her when she passed away. And she was lying there. And my sister and my wife and a few other people. And she gave up her last breath and died. And I looked at that and I went, wow. And in that at immediate time of her being alive to being dead, I said to myself, what is that like for her to go from being on the earth now to seeing Jesus Christ personally? And I turned and I said to my wife, I wonder, because my wife's mother had passed away years ago, and I said, I wonder if your mom is there greeting my mom right now in heaven. If right now your mom Florence just said, Barb, welcome, it's about time. And my grandfather got saved. And so I'm wondering if he's there saying, you know, all these years, my daughter, I'm waiting for you. Because my grandpa got saved wow. uh, later on in life when he was an old man, you know, in the 60s. Yeah, and uh, I was just a young teenager when he got saved, and he would tell me about Jesus. And by the time I was a teenager, I was already partying, having fun. You know, I, I already, uh, you know, threw my youth away to a point. You know, by the time I was 16, you know, my youth, I had already partied and met with many girls and so forth. By that wow. time, my grandpa got saved and told me about Jesus. Well, I had already exchanged. I, <laughs> I had already exchanged the truth for some other stuff at that time. And uh, so now, after my mom passed away, I really was sitting there thinking, you know, are they there to greet her? And then I started thinking, you know what? When I pass, I want to have my mom, my grandpa, Florence, and then all my friends I know. And da, 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 da. I started naming that because I know the truth, I'm going to see them again. And. I think of the Old Testament stories we end about King David when his child died, Bathsheba, that he uh, wouldn't eat, was fasting. And when the child died, he saw the people whispering. He said, what happened? The child died? Yeah. And he said, okay, bring me food. Let's eat. And they said, well, now you want to eat? He said, yeah, because my child will never come back to me, but I'll go see him. And David knew the truth. He, he knew he was going to go see his son. That was just born. And I've always been amazed at that, that King David had such insight knowing that even his baby was just born. He was going to go see him in the Old That's Testament. Stuff. Yeah. So, quite interesting. Huh? So, I really do believe uh, as we, after reading the Acts and Ephesians 1 that we are blessed we know the truth we understand it and our eyes have been opened our eyes are open our heart of understanding understands and that is huge 
our hearts understand. And uh, I don't think there's no greater gift than that. So that's good. That's a quick little story. I just wanted to share. Uh, any, any comments on that one? No. <laughs> we are truly blessed. Well, I don't want to go. Yeah, I don't want to go in chapter or verse five until next week because it's a that's a heavy verse. But uh, uh, I think those verses we ended with Ephesians and Acts and uh, how God is tolerant and God is patient with us. He has self restraint and has forbearance. And again, we talked about that word wrath. Two words: uh, tribulation, wrath. Tribulation is man against man on the earth. Men will kill each other. Wrath is God's judgment on man. And God is holding back his wrath. God is not judging us. And I hear a lot of people think that God has judged us. He's given us AIDS or this earthquake happened or this happened. And I don't believe that God judges us yet. I believe those things are just the corruption of the earth because of sin and man against man. But it, God is it looks very like over and over again, judgment. God gives us up to whatever we Until want to do. Day. I mean, I mean, it's it's not judgment. It's just, okay, you want to do that? Go exactly. ahead. Or, you know, yeah. So. Free will. Yeah, free will. Well, I get tired of people saying it's God's judgment. You know, I, I see religious people saying that all the time. Right. And I, I just don't believe it. I mean, I, I don't see and his wrath coming out of the Everything's got to relate to the uh, the end days. Not, and in, the New Testament. And, Not in the New and Testament sense. Judgment and all that. Ab absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are blessed people, man. Knowing God, we are blessed. Okay. That's how I aim into that. I well, that's how I'm going to end it. So I'll end it with we are well, blessed. <laughs> I guess I'll. Okay. <laughs> I ended it like that. That way you cut off. I'll see you. Like, we are blessed. Well, I smiled. I'll, let me. All right. Well, have a good week. Okay.